Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. In the 1950s, Boeing developed the B-52 Stratofortress, a long-range bomber with a large payload capacity that obliterated the enemy bases during the Vietnam War and in war zones like Iraq and Afghanistan. The U.S. military has been using the B-52 for more than 65 years, which makes it the oldest bomber in the fleet. They plan to keep flying this iconic aircraft for several more decades, which is why it has undergone numerous upgrades to overcome the technological shortcomings required for modern warfare. The B-52 can fly up to 9,000 miles, while it carries a payload of more than 70,000 pounds of various weapons, including bombs, mines, and missiles. The bomber is capable of carrying both conventional and nuclear weapons. A specialized team of munitions airmen follow strict procedures while handling these munitions. The munitions are transported from the storage to the hangar bay using bomb lifts and jammers. The B-52's weapon bay is open manually. And the airmen, while standing on folding ladders, physically align and mount the munitions onto the designated loading points. And uh, for loading, we also use uh, jammers. Uh, we have two different types of jammers, the MHU-83 and the J-1. Uh, we use the MHU-83 as a transfer jammer, so you need the, the meat hook to lift the bomb off the trailer first and then transfer it to the J-1. And then we just uh, put it right up on the jet. It takes about an hour to warm up a B-52. However, the U.S. Air Force sometimes uses explosive charges to start the engines and get the B-52 in the air in less than 10 minutes. The airmen mobilize and proceed towards the assigned aircraft to conduct pre-flight checks and ensure the B-52 is ready to roll. The pilots receive information about the mission and take off to carry out bombing campaigns. As soon as the B-52 reaches the mission location, it releases the munitions out of its bomb bay. The design of the B-52 is a bit narrow. Therefore, both the front and rear sets of landing gear sit just a few feet apart from one another. This makes it challenging for the B-52 to land, especially in a crosswind. Due to the weight of the aircraft, it may require as much as 7,000 feet to land safely. which is why drogue parachutes or drag chutes are often used to slow down the B-52 when it lands on a short or contaminated runway. The bomber houses a drogue parachute with a 44-foot diameter in its tail cone, which deploys with the activation signal from the cockpit. It's important to ensure that drag chutes are operational at all times. So the maintenance teams follow critical procedures periodically to maintain them. They take the drag chutes off the aircraft into specialized facilities, where they unpack, maintain, and repack them to ensure they are ready to deploy on the next flight.
Several other aircraft like the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom have used the drag chutes to slow down while landing. Nicknamed Double Ugly, Old Smokey and the Rhino, the F-4 was retired from active service in 1997. However, it was redesignated as QF-4 and used as a manned and unmanned aerial target until 2016. The final F-4 Phantom appeared during Nellis Air Force Base's Aviation Nation Air Show on November 12th and 13th of 2016, where it taxied out, took off and landed while deploying a drag chute from the back. Norwegian F-35s are unique as compared to other nations' F-35s. They house a drogue parachute and a special fairing on the upper rear fuselage between the vertical tails. The pod containing the drag chute can be installed and removed with minimal time and effort. The pod's design is unique, ensuring that the aircraft maintains stealth characteristics while flying. Unlike the conventional parachutes, the F-35 drag chute system slows down the motion of the F-35 effectively and provides control and stability for the pilots. It creates aerodynamic drag, also known as air resistance, which helps the aircraft land safely on short, wet and icy runways. To deploy the drag chute, the pilot flips the switch on the upper left side of the instrument panel, which activates hydraulic actuators that open the pod to release the drag chute. This helps the aircraft to slow down and ultimately stop on the runway. The F-35 Lightning II is also operated on aircraft carriers. Any platform that we deem the aircraft suitable to launch and recover from needs to additionally be thoroughly tested. So you put those two aspects together, you need to test the aircraft out thoroughly, you need to test it out from runways and aboard carriers as well. Due to the short runways, the aircraft carriers are equipped with unique systems for assisted takeoff and landing procedures. To take off, the F-35 is positioned on the deck. A blast shield is raised behind the aircraft. And the nose gear is affixed to the catapult. As soon as the launch is initiated, the catapult steam piston helps launch the aircraft forward at speeds of around 165 miles per hour. The catapult assist, along with the thrust of the engine, is enough to get the F-35 aircraft launched from the aircraft carrier. While landing, the pilot deploys a special hook located at the rear end of the aircraft, which catches the hydraulically powered cables above the deck. These arresting cables pull the aircraft backward which allows it to stop immediately. Although the pilots flying these planes are very skillful at what they do, most of the credit for these assisted takeoffs and landings goes to the talented flight deck crews. Another aircraft regularly used on aircraft carriers is the FA-18 Super Hornet. It is a supersonic twin-engine multi-role combat aircraft designed as both a fighter and an attack aircraft. The F-A-18 is highly maneuverable, mainly due to its good thrust-to-weight ratio, digital fly-by-wire control system, and leading-edge extension, which increase its controllability during aerial combat. The ability to land on an aircraft carrier highly depends on the landing gear of an aircraft. 
which is why the rear landing gear of the FA-18 includes a large elbow joint, which provides flexibility and shock absorption during landings on aircraft carriers. This unique design allows the landing gear to counter the high impact forces experienced during carrier landings. where the aircraft must decelerate rapidly in a short distance. The elbow joint is an essential component that distributes the forces and protects the overall structure of the aircraft, ensuring safe and reliable landings on the carrier deck. The FA-18 lands the same way as the F-35 using an arresting wire system. On September 10, 2014, several F-A-18s landed on the flight deck of the aircraft carrier USS George H.W. Bush. The pilots attempted to land on the deck one after another. Most of them landed successfully. However, the aircraft that didn't catch any cables took off to try and land again. In addition to external systems, the aircraft have built-in systems known as air brakes or speed brakes to decelerate while landing. When air brakes are extended, they increase the drag on the aircraft to reduce its speed. The FA-18 has a flap-like structure on the top that is activated from the cockpit. And once activated, it slows down the aircraft on the runway. Additionally, the FA-18 also uses other surfaces like rudders, ailerons, spoilers and stabilizers to slow down while landing. Air brakes are different from spoilers. They are specifically designed to increase the drag while making very little change to lift. On the other hand, spoilers reduce the lift to drag ratio and require a higher angle of attack to maintain lift. This method is almost ineffective in reducing higher speed. Aircraft like an F-15 also have flap-like air brakes mounted on top of the aircraft, which only works in two positions, fully extended and fully retracted. When fully extended, it increases the drag and slows down the speed of an aircraft while landing. United States Air Force pilots typically use air brakes in emergencies. Where conventional braking systems might be unavailable or ineffective. On icy or slippery runways, the pilots use drag chutes to counter the wind direction and slow down the aircraft while landing. On the other hand, the United States Navy uses a completely different approach. The decks of aircraft carriers are equipped with arresting systems to stop an aircraft. Moreover, the deck is marked with lights and other visual aids to guide the pilots during landing. All in all, every branch of the U.S. military uses a built-in or external braking system to aid in stopping an aircraft. If these systems are neglected, it can have dire consequences resulting in personnel and property loss. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.